going to start with the Delhi based feminist activist and performance artist Pramada Menon, who I've been a, a, a big, big fan of for many years. And I'm so glad that I finally get to see you here. And, you know, I've been admiring her for all these years, whether when she was a Dastakar, whether she was a Kriya, and, you know, with all the work that she's doing in the corporate world, outside the corporate world, and really having these conversations. This will be followed by a panel discussion and interaction with our very own Nisa Godridge and Pramada. That will be moderated by Farah. Farah is the head of our group's uh, diversity and inclusion initiatives. But Pramada, besides her, you know, has, has been working with a bunch of organizations as a, um, you know, as a consultant on issues of human rights, gender, sexuality, <coughs> organizational change, and really drawing links between all these different issues because they are um, connected. It's about intersectionality and not about looking at them in independent silos. She's also a stand-up performance artist. <coughs> she traveled with her show Fat, Feminist, and Free to various cities. In 2013, Pramada directed her first documentary film called And You Thought You Knew Me, which was about, hmm? <laughs> which was about the lives of five people who were assigned the female gender at birth and their interactions with sexuality, queer activism, and gender. So Pramada, thank you so much for flying all the way from Gurgaon, <coughs> which I know is a different planet from Delhi, um, to be here with us. Um, and welcome to the, to the Gordon India Culture. Yeah, talking of Gurgaon, I always feel that I have to explain why I live in Gurgaon, because which other city would you have which pretends to be America and various other places? So your buildings, which are called uh, Western Green, then you would have something which is called Princeton. Uh, and think of the embarrassment saying that you live in Malibu, but actually it's in Gurgaon. <laughs> so yeah, so I come from there, and of course the latest now is a building called the Privy, uh, which if you know is actually the bathroom. But clearly to Gurgaon, why it's Privy sounds like some really palatial structure. So yeah, I come from Gurgaon, and uh, part of the reason why I do this is that clearly I think of myself as Jennifer Lopez, or I think of myself as Helen or as anybody, I mean, all the oomph. I'm not so sure whether I think of myself as baby doll, but you know, more or less in that category. But clearly nobody else thought so. So every time I wanted to act as a child, and you know, I was always obviously tall and well-built because we didn't ever say fat, right? Because we, fat is a bad word. You say healthy or whatever the other words are. So I used to always be put as the fifth tree from the right or the storyteller <laughs> or you know, the building which is allowed to move in the earthquake. Um, so it was always all of those and I kept wondering, you know, what the hell, I mean, I need to do something with my life. And so I figured the best way to do it is to tell stories and then actually get captive audiences like all of you where you're forced to sit here because it's really impolite for you to get up and leave while I speak. You know, and we've all been taught that. I mean, if you come from good parentage and in current Indian values that we're all being taught, that's one of the Indian values. You don't get up when someone's speaking. So that's why I do what I do. Um, and part of the important thing of telling all of you is that I think that you now always have to give a disclaimer. So no animals were hurt in the creation of this. I've hugged all the right kind of people that meant were meant to be hugged. I've not insulted any community. It bears no resemblance to anybody except myself. So all of that, just take it on board. So I'm not going to have any more disclaimers. And those of you who get offended, just plug your ears. Yeah, because, I mean, there's nothing else I can do about it. Um, so essentially, I mean, if you talk of gender, if people keep asking me why I do the work that I do, and my mother spends her life being really nervous about the work that I do. Because every time I tell my mother I'm going to do a sexuality training, she sort of, you can see she's starting getting fevered brows, and I say, what happened? She said, you're telling people how to have sex? And I'm like, ma, but sexuality is not just about sex, it's about hundred other things. And I think she really still doesn't believe it. She really thinks I'm churning out these little sex machines in different places. <laughs> and, and I wish I could. I mean, I would think it was great if I could do that. But gender, mainly because I figured out that you have to be a certain kind. Everybody has to conform, conform to a particular kind. If you don't conform, life is a bit difficult. So I walk, you know, I walk through my life with people saying, is this a man or a woman? Which after a point, you know, really you feel like saying, okay, what should I show you from my body, which will convince you? I mean, is it okay if I just, you know, expose myself? But clearly that's not enough. So I've had these stories of, you know, going through the airport and people sort of pushing me to the gents line. And you keep wanting to tell them, but why should I go there? And then I tell them I'm madam. And then they say, 
oh, hume pata nahi tha. We were really concerned. We were trying to figure out. And you're like, get a grip on life. It's, it's okay. So I have all these, you know, various stories. But some of my stories, which I love, is people in India are really concerned about you. You could be standing at a street corner, and some random person will come and give you advice. <laughs> random. <laughs> or they want to know about your family. So the standard question is, so are you married? And I've now heard this question so often, and you say no. So right now, at this particular point in my life, they are sort of really worried. And I say, oh, but now, you know, I'm past the age. No, 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 beta. There's still time. <laughs> I'm like, at 50, you want me to get married? So that's one lot. But the other amazing stories is, you know, going down on a Sunday morning to pick up newspapers. And an oldest gentleman, which now in my current phase of life, old for me really means 70 or 80. Earlier, you know, 50 is qualified as old. <laughs> But so the old gentleman walks up to me and says, Beta, do you know where Sahara Mall is? And you know, my mother always taught me that you answer questions when people ask you questions. You know, if they've asked for something, give them the answer, especially if it's a venerable old gentleman. So I was beginning to give this long explanation. Um, and I was like, Nahi, but I can tell you. He said, Nahi, Beta, you should go there because on the ground floor, they have exercise machines. I thought it was really considerate of him, <laughs> you know, and, but, but again, you know, my mother will keep coming into this conversation because it's, she's very important to me. My mother had clearly told me that you cannot be abusive to older people. So in true Delhi style, I thought of all the things I could have told him, but I didn't. And I regret it to this day. And I just so politely say, nee, uncle, theek hai, main bas nee jana nee chati. So that was one. The other thing is that if you have facial hair, which as we know in this country, women don't have facial hair. Nobody knows, it's a closely guarded secret, that we spend hours in parlors, hours. And you're waxing, you're putting hot wax. Now, of course, we have a variety of wax. We can put chocolate wax. And I've never understood why would you put chocolate wax on your arms? It should be in your mouth. I mean, chocolate, not the wax. But nevertheless, you spend hours waxing yourself. Uh, and at the end of it, you come out, and nobody actually believes you have a, hair on, a bit of hair on your body. But actually, at the same time, what's it with metrosexual men now? You know, I like my men to look like men. I like the fact that they would hair on their body. You know, it's sort of in a strange way, it was a distinguishing fact. Now, if you hug a metrosexual man, you sort of slip down, <laughs> and then you end up actually having to do something you never meant to do. <laughs> but it's like, what's, what's with that? But to go back to facial hair. So I spend my life before I travel, it's not about farewells to family and friends. I spend hours actually spending it at the parlor because I have facial hair and I know that the moment I go anywhere, people are sort of, the concentration, other women complain, people look at their breasts. I complain, people look at my beard. And they sort of, and you know, you can see what should they be calling me, sir, madam, etc. So I also know the look that comes in people's eyes. You know, it's a glazed kind of look. It's like, I don't even know. It's not about lust and desire. It's about like, am I seeing right? So every time that, every time that look comes into that eye, I'm sort of like, oh, damn, I need to answer questions. So innocuously, I was in a car driving somewhere with, you know, I had a cab. And so the taxi driver, the look came. And he adjusted his rear view. Clearly not to hit on me, but that look. And then he's, and then now, you know, he looked at me and said, so, aap, uh, aapka koi problem hai? And I was like, like what? And he said, uh, my sister-in-law had the same problem. <laughs> They're like, great, this is free advice. He said, you know what, but there's a really good remedy which you should try. So part of what I try to do in my stand-ups is also give you advice. Handy advice that you can use. So this is the advice I would suggest you get your books out, take notes. You have to go to a people tree. So you people ke ek, ya people ya bargad ke ped pe jaiye. Uspe ek tateye ka chhaja dhundiye. Tateye ke chhaje me se aap chhaja nikal ke le aiye, which is the wasp's nest. You bring the wasp's nest down. You pound it finely. You mix it with the first milk that comes out of the cow. And then apparently you heat it. And then apparently you put it on your face. And the hair goes. And apparently his sister-in-law did it. And apparently I was meant to do it. 
and it would end my life. Because climbing up that Bhargad ka ped, who was going to do that? It wasn't like he was giving me the ladder or telling me he would do it. So that went out. And then on trains, this is the other bit of handy advice. If you're a woman traveling on a train, you're a secretary. Never state what you do. Because if you're a secretary, the maximum conversation some wonderful gentleman will have with you is, so what do you do? I'm a secretary. He can't ask you what letters you type <laughs> or what phone calls you make, right? But if you actually say, I'm, a, I'm in Godridge, then he would want to have a discussion on the locks, on the shampoo, then tell you what the problem was. It's like the occupational hazard of being a doctor. You're a doctor at a party and, some, you know, and somebody will walk up to you and say, I have an abscess here. And the poor man's trying to have his food and you know, this woman has shown parts of her body or whatever else. So similarly, I was on a train and I clearly didn't know that I had to say that, you know, I was a secretary. So I actually ended up saying that I worked on human rights and that I worked on women's rights. And at which point he said, but all women are perfectly free. I give my wife permission to work. She is the one who takes decisions in my family. And I thought, yeah, right, that's the one that I heard. I mean, I've heard of this before, but he continued in the same vein. And I nodded, you know, lovingly as again, my dear mother saying, don't be rude to people. And then he also knew the answer to my problems. Because he said he had a sister who had a similar problem like mine. As you can see, the world is full of prototypes of me. And so I said, so what is the problem? And he said, well, I have the solution. You just need an output of a liter every day. Bislery bottle, slightly larger than this, one liter bottle. Apparently, if you pee one liter every day, all your fat just melts away. <laughs> Random stranger on a train. And I think these are the kind of questions that you know, you're constantly having to listen to, or advice that you're constantly having to listen to. It's like you're on an interview board, you go in for an interview, the woman walks in and if she's new by young and in her 20s, mid 20s, late 20s, what they're seeing is a reproductive machine. They're thinking of maternity benefits. And you can see your ova and your ovaries and your uterus churning there because they're saying cost to company. How many months is she going to be away? And similarly, it doesn't happen when a man walks in. You don't think of sperm. You don't say, oh my God, he's going to take leave after he gets married. So somewhere we need to figure out, you know, what is this about women that everyone goes into nervous tension about? And then at the same time, you're also told that women now, you know, the problem with all women are they're feminists. I hate men, clearly, because as a feminist, I'm meant to hate men. Um, and I can't bear to see so many men in the room. Extermination is the answer. <laughs> like, what is it? What are we doing? Why are they gender wars? I mean, what is this nervousness? I'm also constantly being told, please tone down. Men shouldn't get worried. And I'm like, what are the men worried about? <laughs> like, that we're better than them or we're asking to be better than them? We're not. All we're saying is that can we be equal? So, I mean, unfortunately, you have that lovely statement which says, you know, women can't have it all. And I'm like, why can't I have it all? What, who told us that we can't have it all? And it's kind of tragic because every time I'm at a meeting, and this is when I was much younger, and I was taught how to be a lady. And when you're taught how to be a lady, you're taught how to talk very quietly, silently. And I remember walking into an IDBI meeting, which had men. And all the men spoke like this. And their voices were like this. And every time you tried to gently say something, their pitch went up. And then I learned that the only way you do it is you turn around and talk to them like this. And you could be talking perfect nonsense. But as long as you thump the table three times, and you say, I am saying this to you. Why? Why do I need to do this? Why do I need to go and play golf in the morning? <laughs> and where do I find the time to go and play golf? Like I wake up at 5 in the morning and my other friends who are in the Taj, the GM Taj, the whoever CEO of everywhere else, and you're having these wonderful conversations on golf and of course about your companies and about what you need to do. While the wonderful women who are on similar positions are saying, Aaj khane ke liye kya who, should, who should do the cooking? Because as we've been told, we can't have it all. 
So I have always wanted to go and play golf in the morning, and I keep imagining. So when I wake up at four and go to play golf, and then I have to set the whole house in motion. I have to make sure there's food on the table, and then when I come back after playing golf, I can't just have a shower and leave for work. I have to then figure out what's going to happen next. And so I'm always intrigued, like where am I going to have those little meetings? So what can women do? And I figured that maybe women can have little kitty parties, which are not bad by themselves. I think we sound our own death knell to kitty parties. Why can't kitty parties be as important as, as golf, whatever, in the mornings? So you meet and eat Chinese food, and you discuss politics. In between, you save some money, you talk about whatever else, but maybe we could take world decisions. I mean, what is there that you can't do about it? But it always perplexes me why we spend our time in sort of thinking of all the things that we can do or we can't do because we've been told we can't do it. So part of what I do as professionally in my work is to say that gender is in your head; it's not between your legs, because in this country, everything. Starting from the honor of the family, to the honor of your husband, to your brother's well-being, to your the happy married life of your next-door neighbor, <laughs> to everything lies between the women's legs, because if you can't protect that, then God forbid everything else will fall apart. And so we're constantly spending our life trying to protect women. Are we constantly trying to tell our life what women should be do doing? And I'm fascinated by the notion that we keep saying, you know. Women should be home at eight. The simple question, yeah. If we are not the problem, put all the men who at home at eight. <laughs> Just sit at home. All men, mandatory. Sit at home, watch television, <laughs> educate yourself. Let the women wander. <laughs> There's something about protection that we're not doing right, and I mean, I'm a little concerned because I think we need to think of these novel new ideas. Uh, because I just feel like we don't spend enough time on that, and then of course aligned with this whole thing about woman, man, and you know our issues around harassment, where we're constantly being told as women that if somebody appreciates your beauty, why can't you just be happy about it? If someone walks up to you and says, puts an arm around you, a man puts an arm around you and hugs you, you're supposed to feel feel gratified that they love you, right? Because you're attractive. I mean, somehow I. I Truly don't understand it because I've tried to grapple with this. I've walked down streets and said, "That's a good-looking man," and what can I do with him? <laughs> go home. I go home. He goes home. I don't think it works like that for men. They walk around and say, "That's a good-looking woman. Let me go and tell her she's good-looking," and then let's see where we can have this conversation going. And it doesn't make sense. It's like. In the olden days, when I was growing up, people walked up to you and said, "Can I make friendship with you?" <laughs> and that used to be the bane of my life because it would be strange people who said, "Let's be friends." And I'm like, <laughs> "Today we've gone highly superior because we now do it on Facebook, or we do it on Twitter." And so, you know, the whole cha game changes. And then, of course, if you unfortunately happen to turn down a couple of men, then it will always be that you're lesbian. Because clearly you hate all men, right? And then if you hate all men, you have to be lesbian. And if you're lesbian, the correlation with that is if you're a lesbian, you never go to the parlor, because you have to be a man. Because that's the aspirational goal. <laughs> that all women who are lesbians' aspirational goal is you want to be a man. All women who are lesbians have been abused by men, which means that all of India is actually lesbian. <laughs> Something wrong in it. Um, the other favorite question, if you immediately say you're not heterosexual, is what do you do in bed? It's like this. There's almost a direct correlation. It's like all of it somehow, conversations around gender, conversations around sexuality, always ends up in bed. And I keep wondering why do we need to do that? And then, so that's one axis. Then we talk about um, different ethnicities. So I come from Kerala, and I'm actually really tired of being called a Malu. You know, I feel like saying, "Okay, guys, there is nothing called Saudi, <laughs> and there's nothing called Madrasi, because Madras does not exist. It is Chennai. It's a bit difficult to call somebody a Chennai. What Chennaiite? Or when people look at you and say, 'Oh, you like eating rice, na? You do that thing and you lick your hands.' <laughs> no, I actually don't. 
and I don't have dosas morning, noon, and night. I actually have food like the rest of the people in this country. We sort of box everybody in, and there is a way in which that boxing happens. And it's always fascinating to me that when you start talking about these issues, it's always about go gently. No, like, like really, why do you need to have a gay pride parade? Like, you know, I'm heterosexual. I don't see the need to talk about my sexuality. Yeah, you don't see the need because you're the norm. Everyone thinks everyone's straight in this country. So if, you know, five people get up, no, no, you shouldn't be talking about these issues. It's really terrible. And, you know, we're a conservative society. So I just feel like, when are we ever going to change some of these discussions that we're having around gender, sexuality, the workplace? And I'm constantly fascinated about the fact that very often, as women, you have to take breaks because that child is born. And then apparently all of us have deep motherhood, maternal instincts in us, which sort of flow out. And that the only obsession we have after we have a job, we want marriage and then we want children. And then when you have children, clearly you have to take time off. And I always wonder why don't the men be encouraged also to take time off? Is it that men don't want to play with their kids? Or have we told them that they shouldn't be playing with their kids? It's a brilliant ad that you see. Now we're constantly telling our men, don't cry. What if you want to cry? If you cry, you must be gay. Because the, you, we have very, India is very good that way. We have very definite statements. <laughs> you know, if you cry, you are gay. If you look, if you're a woman who looks like a man, you're lesbian. We, the other thing we're very good at, and especially in North India, is that we're very full of family values. Have you noticed how often the mother and the sister is invoked in every sentence? So it's, I will not, but it's basically, and so it's like, we're wonderful. We use our ma and behen as greeting, as tragedy, as how are you doing today? So it's actually, we're full of family values. And clearly that's those family values that spread out then into our work. And then we don't understand why people can't understand when we're using this language at work because on the street, clearly that's the language that works. So yeah, it's a kind of completely and utterly insane mixed bag. And I just feel like I have to end with telling you something truly sexist. Because I feel you can't actually stand up and tell jokes without having some sexist story coming in. So the sexist story that I can only think of is, uh, why are married women fat? Because a single woman comes home, looks at, her, uh, looks at the fridge, and then sort of goes into bed, and then she's very happy. But a married woman goes to the bed, looks at what's lying there, and then goes to the fridge and stuffs her face. Thank you very much. Uh, Pr Pramila, thank you for that excellent, energizing opening to our evening. That was uh, hilarious, but serious as well. I'm sure many of you have lots of questions about, about what Pramada said. Um, we have a few, and then we'll open it up to discussion. So feel free to ask any questions. We're really committed as Godridge to gender diversity and all sorts of diversity within and outside the organization. So I'm very excited to have both Nisa and Pramada here today with us um, to actually look at the inside and the outside um, in a, from a diversity lens. So, so the first question, um, you, know, you actually already mentioned this, um, society and culture is often cited as reasons for discrimination. We're India. We're like that only. Uh, do you believe we even have the power to change um, this sort of culture or society? I mean, clearly I do. Otherwise, I would have retired many years ago. Um, yes, I mean, I, I think the fact that I'm actually here in Godridge doing this to me is clearly it's, you know, a sign of the changing times. Did I imagine that this would happen 20 years ago? No. Um, and I think that the, the challenge for all of us is I think that it's very easy to succumb to saying, well, this is how it is and we're not going to change. Um, I think the challenge is to turn around and say, yeah, it's not been like this, but so how can we change it? So the fact that I also look around and see the number of women sitting here, and I think that my mother would have loved to work, but I don't think she had the opportunity because she had to get married. And very clearly, my father wanted a wife who was educated enough to teach the children, but not educated enough to go out to work. Um, so, yes, you have just believe in that change, and unfortunately, no change is going to happen unless you fight for it. 
So there is going to be a fight, and yes, of course, it will change eventually. Sometime. Your child, okay. second one. <laughs> Lisa, do you want to add anything to that? What are your thoughts? Um, yeah, I, I mean, so I have to, my father's sitting here, so I've had a bit of a different sort of growing up experience because I think I grew up with a father who was very egalitarian and he never said that your brother can be this and you can be that. He just said you can be whatever you want to be, you know, and I'm here to support you do that. So um, my worldview is, has always been that, you know, women are very equal and you can do whatever you want. In terms of, um, in terms of change, I definitely think change uh, can happen and it can happen quite quickly if you sort of stay on it and sustain it. And I think when we have, you know, when we're having discussions like this, hopefully, you know, people are inspired by her stories or, you know, inspired by someone else's answers uh, to some of these things. So I think change can definitely happen and it can happen quite rapidly. Let's hope so. Um, you also mentioned, Pramada, about uh, having it all. And I think many of us have heard of uh, Indra Nui's comments on women can't have it all. And it's generated a lot of controversy, actually, right? Can we have it all or not? So um, what are your personal opinions on this? We sort of know where you stand, but what, is, what does even having it all mean for you? Having it all means that I have equal opportunities as all men and all women and all trans, and every human being must have equal opportunities. And can we just have it not because of who we are in terms of being a man or a woman? Because for me, the, quest, the point is, I actually think men don't have it all. Yeah. I really think that a lot of men have, have been given the short end of the stake, and I don't know whether they realize it, but honestly, for a lot of men who might never want to be in a job, who might want to just be an artist, be a painter, be a dancer, not be that engineer, want to cry at home, want to be a singer, are you allowed it? No. Because you have to be the wage earner, and you have to marry, and you have to have the children, and you're expected to do a certain amount of things. So you don't have it all, and so therefore I don't understand why men then don't stand up and say, well, we don't have it all, and you don't have it all, and shouldn't we be changing the world? So for me, it is kind of scary when somebody, a woman who is in a fairly senior position, uh, and who is meant to be inspirational and has broken the glass ceiling, turns around and says, women can't have it all, so how did you get there? And for me, yes, I have it all. I, f I fought bitterly for it, and I will continue to fight for it. But I also think the fight somewhere has to be not just women fighting for it. It's really about, can we walk together and can men also at some point turn around and say, we are not these horrible people that people are making us out to be. <laughs> really, I mean, it amazes me that I don't see any men saying, well, actually, we're not all rapists. We're not all doing terrible things. And we have a tough time. Can we have that conversation? Yeah, I, I definitely agree with her. I'd like to ask, you know, ask all the men in the room, you know, who here actually thinks they have it all, correct? Because I think it's a very, it's, I think the idea of having it all is very individualistic to you and it shouldn't be decided by, um, it should definitely not be decided by your gender, correct? So maybe having it all for me is, uh, you know, just having a career, maybe it's just having a family, maybe it's doing both, maybe it's being an artist, but I think that should be very individually defined and not defined by anyone else or what you think is sort of right. And I just had a baby um, eight months eight months ago, and it is interesting because there is this definition of what it is to be a good mother or a good, and I've not had much of it growing up, but you definitely, you, you, you sense that little bit of, uh, that little bit of pressure to be a certain way, correct? And I think my advice to everyone is to just do it your own way and you know, really decide what it means for you, what is having it all for you and pursue it. Don't you know, think about how other people define it. So it is a very complex statement, having it all. It would be interesting to see a show of hands of everyone who believes that it's possible for us as an individual who you are to have it all. Do you want to? Absolutely, yeah. But just today, if you were to answer, do you believe no, that you can have I, it all? I think the question would be what you define as what you think is all. If you yeah. think you can have it all, then you are going to have it all. What's your definition of having it all? I don't know. I don't have one right now. It's food for thought when you go home. 
They couldn't have it all. Okay. Today, let's say if they wanted to be an entrepreneur or something, they would have those two, three years to just uh, do whatever they wanted to do. And as men also like, okay, for two, three years, we can say that we have it all. That two, three years, you do whatever you want. Your parents will not say you or what, will not tell you what to do to, to, uh, to study or to come to office or to take up a job. So I think uh, within a certain limited definition, uh, some of us, uh, do get it all, but you have to pay a price for that. For a certain time period. And right? you have to yeah. pay a price for that. Yeah. Okay. I also feel that for women, the definition of having it all means to be able to take care of the family and have a career. But for men, if one is a decent wage earner, people don't ask whether one is a, one takes care of his family well enough. Yeah. Absolutely. So like I said, it's a question of how you define having it all. Yeah. And so for the men in the audience, how many of you believe that you have well, it all? My new joke is that my brother took more maternity leave than I did. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he's going to appreciate yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> no, he had his baby in New York, that's a disclaimer. But yeah, I, 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 I don't think, I think, I think men, at least the men I see around me, a lot of them do want that quality time uh, with their children and want to be good fathers, not just successful. So I think what you said earlier and even what you said about your brother is very important. Um, and it's also linked to what Pramila said, we really need to make more showcases and more role models of men who are doing things differently. Um, because if we are having men in our homes and in our lives who are acting say, in a more inclusive manner in terms of defining what success means for themselves and demonstrating that, we need... Because I think we have enough role models of, say, horrible men, but we don't have enough role models of men who are, uh, who are reaching out and crossing these barriers and doing it wonderfully. Um, so it might be very nice to actually you know, showcase them more, uh, reward them more, either just with recognition. Well, I, I, I don't even feel that then you're actually putting them into another category as though it's some special task they're doing. But I mean, just to give an example, I think that most of you have seen the ad where you have a woman who's you know, telling the men to work and then goes home and then, of course, once she goes home, she's of course cooking food for her wonderful husband because the husband's working late. Now, at some levels, how desperate we are to actually see women in, in positions of power. And we all look at it and say, oh, my God, that's so exciting, there's a woman in power. Uh, similarly, if we were to actually have ads which showed men as doing multiple tasks, and in fact, there is, there is, there's an other lovely ad of a woman who can't leave the child and then the husband stays back to be with the child and it sticks in your mind because it is just so unusual. So I think it's part of not actually saying, oh, you know, you're wonderful, you're doing what other pe women may be doing every day. It's just to say it's possible for you to do these things and, you know, what is stopping you and you don't have to be gay to do it. You can just be a man-man and do it or and you don't have to be a real man because I think there's also this other problem of creating these real men versus the unreal men. But yes, I think you know you have we have to create alternate images. Actually, this is going very well into my next question about norms and expectations around gender. So men often feel that they have to be strong and subscribe to some male stereotypes. Uh, but you know the importance, like you said, Parmesh, of including men in this gender diversity debate is is paramount. Do you feel that men are actually realizing that that you know this fight for gender equality is actually for men as well and men need to be involved for it to actually be successful? And how do you think we can speed this up? Like in your experience uh, as an activist and your experience in the workplace, uh, what can we do? You go first. I don't want to show you up. You go first. Come on. <laughs> um, well, part of me actually says, feels that that maybe we may not be about able to probably do it together. It is about power. I think we need to recognize that this is clearly about power. It's about one set of people giving up power and one set of people taking on power. And to the best of my ability, I know that when I have to relinquish power, how difficult it is. So when I gave up a full-time job of you know, running an NGO, which I had founded and then left, the next day waking up and knowing that you don't have an organization to return to, and that actually no one's going to take you seriously because now you don't work, was kind of a bit of a shock, and then you get on with it. But I think that we have to think of power sharing. We have to think of ways in which we can work together without other people feeling threatened. You know, when 
Unfortunately, the world is polarized. Unfortunately, the way perpetrators and the victims, and we end up pushing people into victim positions, we have to figure out ways in which we can change the way the, our society is sort of working. I mean, I know this is getting into a serious kind of thing, but I really think it's about women turning around and saying, this is not acceptable, this is acceptable. It's about men actually saying what is acceptable to them and what is not, given that there are things that are changing. How do we actually talk to each other? Actually, we don't talk to each other. We never have a conversation which is based on equality. It's about, I'm your father, I'm your brother, I'm your boss, I'm your whatever, in whatever, whether it's a woman or a man, and I, or I'm your mother. And then this constant re, you know, claiming of Indian values, stop looking at the West. I mean, of course you're looking at the West because that's where you want us to be. You want us to be, you know, want us to progress to having malls. You want us to wear Benetton. You want us to wear Prada. You want Armani suits. But keep your Indian heart inside you. So there's a certain way that values are being pushed down your throat where this world is changing. And I'm, I'm talking primarily of cities. I am not even going into looking at rural areas where opportunities do not exist. That war is a war. Because the amount of freedom that we are able to have or negotiate, I don't even think that that is like, you know, women can't have mobile phones because clearly if, you have, if a woman has a mobile phone, she's calling up lovers. I live in Haryana where I'm constantly hearing of the khap panchayats, where if you eat chow mein, apparently your senses get inflamed. Uh, if you have a mobile phone, your senses get inflamed. Everything sen gets your senses inflamed. Um, and of course, the men are these lovely people who ha are able to say nothing. So for me, the question is that men have to speak up just like women. Um, and we really have to figure out ways in which we have a conversation together. This is about a conversation. It's not about a war. It's not, I'm better than you. Yeah, or tight jeans as well, if women, if, if women wear jeans as yeah. well. Eating Chinese, carrying a mobile and wearing jeans is uh, the end of the world for India. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I think definitely the conversation has to have happened together, because I think if you're having it separately, you're not really making a change. Um, I actually believe, I think Pramesh touched on it, it's, I think there's going to have to be quite a bit of role modeling. I think for any change to happen, people have to see examples of, you know, we are like this, we are holding on to these beliefs, but it could actually be um, like that, correct? And then I think men really have to be parts of those conversations because they are fathers, they are bosses. What they tell their five-year-old is going to make a difference. So I definitely think, um, you know, it it definitely has to happen together. and. I know I've, I've grown up with a very privileged sort of worldview because of the good men, because of my father, because of my brother that I've grown up uh, with, correct? But that is also possible, yeah. correct? So it, we don't have to only just always do. And I think when you look at media and India and stuff, it, you know, it's, there's also people tend to sometimes look at this lowest common demo denominator instead of really... Um, sometimes on these conversations looking at best in class and how things could be, whether it's in, I mean, look at ICICI and stuff, correct? So there are things even within India uh, which are very positive when we look at sort of gender equality. Anecdotally, we were running a workshop for some of our senior management. Um, there was about 20 men in the room and we asked them if they had children and they all had daughters. And actually that gave me a lot of hope because I said, okay, these are senior leadership and they all have daughters and the messages that they pass on to their daughters is what's going to hopefully change. So at least at Godridge, I'm looking forward to the next yeah. generation of very strong female. Take a look at the orbit columns in any newspaper and you will find grandmother and then after that, grandsons, sons, more sons, more sons and more sons. There are no daughters, ma'am. You're lucky if you belong to an organization where so many people have daughters. I worked for an organization private, uh, prior to where I am currently, and all the faculty, each and every one, barring myself and my boss, only had sons. You travel by a second class local compartment, there'll be one child and it'll be a boy. But look at the obituary columns, ma'am. There's only sons, more sons, grandsons, and then there'll be one name as a great-grandson. I think that has more to do with the fact that they don't want to list daughters. After they get married, they consider they don't belong to the family, so they only list sons.
So I think that at one level, one is also one is questioning patriarchy and saying that why can't I actually light my father's fire? When my father dies as a Hindu, if I wish to carry him into the crematorium and I wish to do the puja, I will do it. And I did it for my father, my both, both of us, my sister and I. And I think that these are questions that we're asking. But for me, actually, a more telling thing from what she's saying is the fact that they may not be women. Because we do have, we have to understand that South Asian countries clearly have a son preference. We do like our sons. We do want to have sons and we aspire to have sons. And so it's great to have a daughter because she can get dressed up. But let the moment she attains puberty, our nervousness begins because then now God, either she's going to have an affair or she's going to get raped. Both of those are the obvious immediate kind of things. It's never about maybe she'll have a good life, maybe she can actually be looking after me, maybe she can have a good job. I wanted to talk about, uh, I think, the largest media company in India where I worked as a general manager where women were being openly molested and raped. Okay, now, uh, this happened at one retreat, corporate retreat, second corporate retreat. Then I went and spoke to my HR manager. I spoke to the CEO, and they wouldn't do anything about it. And then I went to the American parent company, which had invested money here. And the next day, I was fired. Now, the woman who told me about this, that this girl is being raped, that girl is being raped, she continues to work there as an anchor. Now, you know, FGM, FG, female genital mutilation in Africa, is where the mother tells the daughter, you need to get FGM done, the grandmother. So yeah, this co-option, where women feel co-opted into a system wherein they remain silent in, in the midst of all this thing happening. I'm not blaming the women. All I'm saying is the patriarchy is that strong that the women, if they want to hang on to that position, cannot speak out about uh, such things happening in corporate India today. I'm actually, a correlation to that would be for me, it's, you know, we constantly say it's the mother-in-laws, it's, you know, it's all these evil women. And it's one is what you say that we're, everybody sitting in this room is a handmaiden to patriarchy. We all keep patriarchy alive in some way or the other. And part of the challenge, which I always feel, is that when that woman is saying yes to FGM, why are the men in the house silent? When, if, if this story of the rape, part of the challenge, I think that, you know, this question of sexual harassment at workplace, very often women are not talking about it because they need that job or that you, so you're, you're so conditioned into believing that anyway no one's going to believe you. Uh, and, and we have enough cases now in this, in this country to know that what happens when you do complain about a powerful media baron uh, who may have been honest and scrupulous in all other ways. Uh, and for me, a classic example is working with people in Palestine, with young men in Palestine, on issues of domestic violence. And just a question of asking them if Yasser Arafat was actually known to be, let's say, a wife beater, what would your reaction be? And they said, we're fighting for independence, and that's far more important. You know, so part of the question is, what are the trade-offs? So what is the trade-off that woman had to do to be there, and what is the trade-off you had? Uh, the question is, how long are you going to be silent about it? And you know, you did what you thought was right. She's probably doing what she thinks is right. Uh, actually, this is in response to quite a few statements that you all made. And we're, we're talking about equality between the two genders. We're talking about males stepping up as role models and creating role models that everyone else can know how to treat women in this country, talking about equality. But what we're forgetting is that we come from a privilege of being in a patriarchal society. So men already have that privilege. So first, we have to talk about how many of us are willing to give up that privilege. That is such, such an important discussion here because when we're talking about creating role models, what kind of a role model are we creating? Are we creating it from scratch, from an e equal base? Or are we creating uh, role models from this already existing patriarchy? For the, like, for the very simple reason that you talk to a large part of the Hindu uh, uh, customs within India, people who believe in Hindu religion, their perfect idea of a man is Rama. And somehow, Rama doing what he did to Sita is absolutely fine because he was Uttam in every other form. So when you're talking about equality, the perfect man itself is so problematic. So I don't think this, this question of whether a man will give a place for a woman as she deserves, I think it's a little too early for us to be talking about this because we have to, first of all, kind of defeat what patriarchy has done for so many years. Yeah, but I think that's the issue, Gray. Why do you have to give up anything to give a place? I actually think in a more... I'll give the example of my father again, correct? I think he's in a better position in his life
to be the sort of person he is because he has three kids, not just his daughter, even his son, who love him, who are open with him, who are not like, oh, because you're our father, we have to come and you know, talk to you or speak to you or respect you because we're, you're our friend, we're your children, we love being with you, we like to hang out with you, correct? And it's a very different, I don't think, I don't think by not being patriarchal or putting, I, I think you will, I think all men and all women will actually gain, correct? What do you gain by being? Yeah, but I don't think it's just, I, it, I, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that, correct? But it's actually saying, that if you if you take the view that my brother says, okay, why should my sisters also inherit, correct? It's also taking the sort of view that you don't have any value to add, correct? And I might be, I'm not saying that I am, but I might be 10 times brighter uh, than my brother. I might be able to create much more wealth for the family, correct? So it's are you basing it just because I'm a woman versus a man or versus on other sort of... But so I'm, I'm see, I understand that I come from, especially in a country like India, quite a minority. I come from a very privileged background to have the kind of sort of father and the kind of education he had and the education we had. But I think, at least in my mind, and it's not simple, I don't think it'll happen just over one generation, correct? But it's reframing to actually say that why, why being more liberal or why, you know, why gender equality or why gay rights, you know, it's actually showing people how it works and why it's better, correct? Right. So can I just add, and I know there are lots of hands in the audience, I think that, you know, what you're saying is that it's not that we woke up one day and discovered this patriarchy. Clearly we belong in a patriarchal society. But some of the questions for me is that why is it always pitched against that the women have to fight patriarchy? I understand that, as I said, men are not going to give up power. I completely understand. And why would you want to give up power? You know, you're giving up your property. Why should my damn sister on whose you know, wedding people have spent so much money, now she wants to get property too. That is the argument that's being used. But I think that if we are not going to have this conversation, then we are asking for war. Because part of what I always feel is when we start talking of equality, when, it's, you know, we, when we talk of rights, you're really saying that somebody has to give you rights. If you're going to say that you know, we cannot even have a discussion on this here, I mean, here as in I'm saying amongst all of us, where we're recognizing huge amounts of privilege, that we're having this conversation in English, we're sitting in the places that we are. If we are unable to do that, then I really think that we should just pack up and say, all right, great, we can't have this conversation because I work in communities and I actually see the fights that people have to just get to that school. To actually, you know, young girls in Jharkhand where there is a program running, to teach them football, using football as a means of actually talking to them about their lives and human rights, for them to use the field which is in front of the village, the boys don't want them to play football on it. And the girls are turning around saying, we will play football on it. They're fighting over that. Because their parents have ta taught them that the boys will have more access. So somewhere the question is about, can we, at least all of us who are here and who are thinking these thoughts, start looking at life a little differently about what we are negotiating and what we are actually talking about. And can we make some changes? So yes, of course, it's Mariada Purushottam Ram, and I look at you know, all the kind of imageries, but it's interesting that we look at those imageries and we don't look at Kunti, who looked at the sun and had a child. So are we, not, we never say that's illegitimate. We you know, worship a whole, we look at Ayyappan, who was born of two men, actually, or a transgender. We never talk of that. There are always examples for us which are of these wonderful women who apparently kill themselves for their husbands, for their parents, for everybody, but never about other stories. And for me, the question is that there is even one, one story which talks, tells you about change. Can we at least talk about those stories? So somewhere, I feel that we, we, we sort of constantly go back to Ram, and I think it's time we changed those models and thought of some newer hip types that we can talk about. Shifting gears just a little bit, actually, you know, we're talking about men and women role modeling and also being an important, both equal parts in this debate of getting to gender uh, equality. Let's talk a little bit about this in an organization or a workplace. Like, really, why is it important? Right? We function pretty well with uh, lots of men or lots of women in certain organizations. Why is it so essential for us to have uh, both genders represented in an organization? 
I just think from the organization's perspective to be able to tap full potential, correct? If you say you can hire from 100 people, you have a choice from 100 people, or you say you have a choice from 50 people, I'd much, choo much rather choose from 100 uh, people, correct? So I think uh, one is just full potential. Um, I think the second, uh, the second part is uh, we, we serve, you know, we represent, we serve a world, we serve consumers. And I think having, um, you know, a fair balance of all sorts of diversity just makes you better able to serve consumers, correct? Because then you're, uh, I don't think you can mirror society exactly, correct? But I think the more that you can be more representative of the world that you're working for, I think the better it is. I think that it's, for one, I don't think it's just men and women. I think we have to start talking of the uh, entire other community of trans men and trans women. Um, and it's about job opportunities for everybody. Yeah. It is about any organization, whether it is the person standing at your gate, the worker there, your father, everybody contributes to this organization. We obviously recognize it. And if you're saying that the world o all over, that if you have to have everybody working in it, I think it's about employing people irrespective of where they come from, exactly. of what they are. I assume that in Godridge or in any company, you're hiring people because of what they bring to the organization. Yeah, not it's not about whether they're from the South. It's or what's in their head. That is I the policy. Then yeah. I think that you just get people in. I think sometimes what we end up having to do, and, I, and I've been asked this because when uh, we, uh, we co-founded Kriya, my friend and I had co-founded Kriya, and uh, as an organization, we hired a lot of women. And it was like what we called affirmative action. And everyone said, why are you only hiring women? We said, we never have men applying for this job. And it's not as though we didn't pay decent salaries. It's not as though we didn't have decent benefits. We probably had really good benefits for an organization which is working in the social justice sector. It's because, ostensibly, they didn't see a career graph where you joined somewhere and you became the CEO. Because that's not the way we work. Um, and I would actually, all the trainings we did, we had, we said we would work with women. Um, and the reason was that men got opportunities, rural women rarely got opportunities. So that was the kind of affirmative action. But I think within organizations, it's like, you know, if to be really cliched, it's like, that's what your constitution states, right? Our constitution says everyone's equal. It says, you know, we're a secular country. I feel that we are forgetting all these things. We are actually being really choosy about who we get in, on what basis we're getting in. And uh, for me, nothing works like diversity. You know, if, if both of us were the same, it would be actually really boring. I mean, can you imagine many of either just me or either just her? You, mean you don't want to be like me. I I'm just really like want, that's that's a separate <laughs> conversation. I I'm going to give you some advice after this. <laughs> about, but so it, it. for me, it's like, when are we going to have those conversations? So my kid was sick today. I left. I, ha I had to come back for this because I'd committed to it. I left. I went to the doctor with him. My husband came there. And then he took him home after that, correct? So it is possible. And, you know, we, because of our financial sort of thing, we do have a lot of help. We have both sets of grandparents, correct? But as a mother, you want to be there. I think, I don't think it's about the corporate. I don't think it's about organizations or women. I think the thing goes in tandem, correct? Because I think if you want a career, if you want to be a CEO of a company, whether you're a woman or a man, you are giving up a lot of yourself. Being a CEO of a company is a job of five people, correct? So I think we need to understand that there's a reality of being in very senior positions. I think women and organizations need to work together. I think as an organization, I can say I can give you the flexibility. If your child is sick, if something's happening, you go home. And it's not just if you're a woman, if you're a man, correct? My husband's organization should do the same thing for him. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, we have stakeholders that we are responsible to creating value to, you deliver it, correct? Then you work till one o'clock in the morning, even if you've not slept the night before because your kid was sick. So I think that, I, I think the conversation needs to happen. It, it needs to be in, uh, it needs to be in tandem. Another example, I was speaking to a, 
a, a woman who works at Godridge, very high potential uh, employee, who's uh, married but not, not had children. She said, you know, I'm planning to have children in the next couple of years. And she said, you know, I'm planning to take a year off. And we, we offer that too. We offer like six months maternity and then, you know, six months um, you, can, you can further take leave on. And I said, look, this is a very, very personal view of mine. It's up to you what you want to do. But I wouldn't take a year off. I'd take six months, I'd take six months off because by a year, your child's going to be so attached to you and not going to anyone else. You're going to be so involved. Coming back to work is going to be really sort of hard. So I was saying it from more from the mother perspective than just the organization. So I think, again, like we, I think organizations and women need to work together. And I think it needs to also be quite individualized sometimes in each case. It's not just about having policies. And I think what you're saying about you know, HR asking or people asking, I think we should just take it as a fact. If you, if I'm hiring you and, uh, uh, you know, you've just got married or you're in that child, it's, there's no way it's not going to cross my mind, correct? So I think, I, I think what we need to do is acknowledge that we need flexibility. How do we work around, but, but not deny that it's not there, correct? And I think in the Ameri there's a lot of, there's a lot of, literature about men looking after the kids and why can't the man do more and stuff but also biologically as a mo like I didn't have to go back to town to take him to the doctor my husband could have gone or but I'm his mother so I want to be sort of there so I think I think organizations and women and men need to work together to create that flexibility okay much that you know yeah. it's our long and deep yeah. relationship we're going yeah. to begin but I'm yeah. going to disagree with yeah. you okay. um, I think that that there is a, a very clear essentializing of women uh, as all mother uh, as all women want to have children uh, as all women who want to get married and then that's why we get married so that we can have children and part of it is clearly I feel that in today's world you don't need to have sex to have children you need eggs you need sperm and you need a and, a, and somewhere a reproductive something where you can put it into um, and so you surrogacy is coming in because of that and let's be honest that you know that is the way it's going to happen but I do think that when we say that um, why are we unable to create a place where both parents are going to be equally responsible for that child to say that you know if if I had a child and my husband couldn't take leave or couldn't take time out because you know his job was more important I think there is a problem, but I think we have created systems which whatever sector, I'm not, you know, whether it's corporate, whether it's a third sector, whether it's the government, wherever, where there is the understanding that men are always going to be in positions of power and therefore they are so busy they don't have the time. And I've watched this, I mean, and, and my own reaction, so I watch a lot of Malayalam films and in one of the Malayalam films they said let's go to meet the DSP or DC, the DCP. And I remember I expected to see a man as a DCP and when it was a woman, I was like, <gasps> this is so pleasantly surprised. And then of course I thought, she's a police woman, how does she manage her life? Because that's my problem. But I do think that somewhere what we have to figure out is that why, why do we not allow paternity leave of the same time? Why do we not say that actually when a man walks into office, I think maybe we should be actually thinking if he's married, he's going to take time out for his marriage, he's going to take time out to look after those kids. Because maybe, maybe I just want to give, have a child and maybe I never want to look after, spend all that time cleaning diapers or whatever. I don't think we're allowed that luxury. It is understood that you first have your child, get on with your work, then take a few years, then have your next child. Um, and I think that we're talking of this again in very privileged situations and I think that if you look at the reality for most people, they, get, they have to have their child and get back to work the next day because they don't have the luxury of actually figuring out um, you know, where the money is coming from and why don't we have crash facilities in, in, in organizations? Why do we not have a place where the kids can come in up to a certain age so mothers can work, can breastfeed? These are all kinds of things that we don't... If I want to breastfeed, I should have the possibility of being able to breastfeed or I should have the possibility of any person working in an organization for them to bring their children in. Uh, but I think that, that we spend our life 
actually essentializing women and saying that all women want to have those children. Some do, some don't. Some don't have their equipment working all right. Um, what what happened? But I'm but I'm saying it's. A I'm saying that conversation has to happen between the organization and women, correct? And you're giving me, I mean, you're saying even men, uh, we have examples, correct? And I'm not saying, I think we're as an organization on a journey, so I'm not yeah. saying, oh, we're so great and we've done it, we have a long way to go. But we've had examples when a man's actually come and said, you know, my wife's got this great job. We had a recent example in HR, she has to move to Singapore and I have to sort of move with her, correct? Now, whether it, was a, it would have been a woman or a man, I think our reaction would have been the same, but we were like, you're really fantastic. We think you're doing great work. Uh, a lot of your work's international. You go live in Singapore, and you come and you be now in Bombay once one week of the sort of month, correct? Now, he, he, now he has to be willing to do that. Now, if they have kids, they have to figure, I think it has to be a two-way, but we can't say, you know, you're so fantastic or whatever, so we don't ever need to see you again, but you can still stay in the... So I think, I think that dual thing needs to happen, and I definitely agree, as an organization, we should give the same rights to men and encourage them to say, you can also go to the doctor, you can go home, you can do this. But yeah. I do see men doing it now, yeah, correct? My kids have exams. No, no, my kids have exams. ICSE is going on, something's happening. I can't take a meeting at this time. And I get requests saying, because sometimes you know, we'll have a meeting that's outside the office or on a Saturday. Uh, I've had meetings where men have said, women have said, I'm, you know, I'm pregnant, I can't travel so much. Equally, men, senior men have said, my kids have exams, uh, you know, can we not have this meeting this day? See, I'm not denying that there you, is a change. See, yeah. I, I don't, I, but I think that is not the norm. We haven't reached a place where that is accepted. So. If a man says, well, I have to go today, you know, I'm really going home early and I can't go out yeah. drinking with you buddies because my kids have an exam, I have a feeling that the rest will look and say, really? Like you're going to look after your kids? Because there's also disbelief. And I do think yeah. that we have to look at how do we change the corporate yeah. No, no, culture. I'm just giving yeah. my... Exp uh, yeah. Mine is a very small worldview that I'm sharing. I'm not saying that it's... I mean, you've probably had a lot more experience with a lot more organizations. I was just reacting to her saying, if I give advice to women, I wouldn't... You also have to be part of that change, correct? And you have to understand that organizations are in a way profit-making machines to as much goodness and stuff that you can have. So there, we have to have these conversations. Yeah. There has to be a middle sort of meeting ground. And profit can be done with fair policies somehow, I believe. I mean, I can make money by being nice too. You know, it does, you're not, I don't think all corporates no, no, are... I think what I'm saying is, if you're a woman and you you really you know you sort of really want to have a strong uh, strong career, you need to have those conversations yeah. with people and don't get you know if something doesn't go. I've had people and you know even in my position, I've had people say, oh you know your brother will take over things or things like that. Y you just have to learn also to just let it wa some of these things wash over you can't take it so seriously if you have someone stupid in hr goes to speak to someone else in hr or find someone who is smart i mean where are all our hr people i didn't say that <laughs> so if i'd like to add to that bit about it really being a conversation i just want to share an incident that happened when i joined Godridge. Um, one of the things I wanted to do was... And like positive PR, correct? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, like let's find out. <laughs> uh, I had a PR <laughs> sitting there being like, you know, allowed to say negative things. Yeah, joking. well, okay. <laughs> let, let, let's see what he makes of it. Um, no, but it's actually, it's, 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 it's an incident that I want to share because, I mean, well, you were part of it. So <laughs> let, let's see if it's positive or not. Um, but one of the things I did is when I, I said I want to work for a company which is it's not linked to gender, it's linked to sexuality. I said I want, I want to work for a company which is um, LBGT friendly. So we said, how do we find out if Godridge is LBGT friendly? Um, so one of the things is, okay, let's look, you know, one is being friendly in terms of encouraging LBGT, the second is not discriminating against. So we said, let's look at the HR policy and see if it's discriminatory. So we read, we read it and we were like, we shan't discriminate against anyone on the basis of caste, creed, religion, et cetera, gender, but there was no sexuality. Um, so I was like, you know, it. So this means it's not LBGT friendly. Uh, perhaps we should say that we won't discriminate again against anyone on the basis of sexuality also. Um, and then I, when I went and spoke to people at HR and to NISA, I said, why is this not there? They were like, 
no one, no one mentioned it earlier, no one asked for it. So I was like, do you mind putting it in? And they said, no, of course not. So, I mean, the next day we had a very new HR policy which added the word sexuality and suddenly Godrej became a company that doesn't discriminate against anyone on the basis of their sexuality. So in, that, in terms of that conversation, often it is, I don't think companies, sometimes companies don't deliberately, sometimes they're just unaware. Um, and if you can have that conversation, it, um, they're actually quite amenable to, to change. I don't remember anyone from that discussion some years ago saying this is not a good idea. Um, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't put this term in and you know, whatever. So I, it, and then often these changes at a policy level happen um, overnight and quite easily. Then of course the harder bit of actually <laughs> getting cultural change. But there are small steps and they actually take place quite often if you can just have that conversation. So I just wanted to add that. Yeah, again, talking about media organization and story, which is about eight years ago. And uh, I had the, uh, I had two rounds of interviews, it, everything was finalized. And then I throw the bomb of the question that whether they had a crash. And uh, the editor in question, he said, of course we have a crash. And you know, you can, I mean, it's the daycare, I mean, the crash is so good that you can just forget about a child when you're on field and stuff like that. So he said, you go and speak to that lady in the crash. And uh, she told me uh, the crash shuts at 5.30 PM, OK? And then I went back to the editor. And I said, and what, what, what are my, my working hours? And he said, you have to be in office till 1 AM till the page is closed. And I said, what, what do I do about the meanwhile? So he said, OK, you go and go back and have a conversation with her. And I went and spoke to that lady. And she said, OK, I'll wait for you till 6. And after which, I'll keep your child out. And my child was one year old. <laughs> so I mean, it's it really, it, uh, you know, it's not always, uh, you know, about a conversation. I think somewhere, uh, you know, things are just closed. And uh, you know, this editor, he had a, I mean, he had this, uh, you know, going, I just wanted to say this to you, that one of the most concerning aspects of a conversation of anyone who's delivered is, have you had a cesarean or was it normal? Even your watchman will ask you that, perhaps, you know? And this guy asked me this question. And he was having all these inane discussions with me. But when it came to the crash, uh, you know, I mean, there was just nothing uh, discussed after that. So you know, it's not always about a conversation. And there's a huge fight. But you know, I stand uh, on the shoulders of my mom, who was a working woman. She has faced many more obstacles. So I, you know, keep, I will keep fighting, and I am going to make it, uh, you know, easier for my daughters. I think I, you know, we can just hope for that. But it so. is about a conversation then. It is about the conversations you are having that your mother had with you, that you've had with your editor, that your editor has gone home and thought, ah, that's possible. That I have to think of it. It is at the end of the day about conversations. The problem is we're not having enough conversations. Yeah. We're not asking the sticky questions, and maybe we need to do. That just as I think that while we're sitting here and you know there are, we're all talking, those questions and some of those answers we may never find. But if you're going to question, like I think the fact that we're sitting here and actually, to me it always amazes me that in, you know, it's taken us so long to be able to sit in offices and talk about sexuality or to say that somebody is gay or somebody is lesbian. Why did it take so long? Because everyone is, hum is a human being. But just to be able to articulate it that that you, we have to actually, that, you know, permission to meet is that in the 2000s, if we actually have to go through, book, you know, places to see what are their policies, can we be out in a job? To me, it just seems that it's taken us so long to reach here. But, and I, it's but I think it's also the message that we want to send yeah. here, correct? I'll give an example that PNG, who's a competitor of ours, is excellent at diversity, right. correct? So we've had a few of these companies come in, talk to us, and on this we're collaborating, okay. correct? And there's simple things. I mean, Farah's done some work on this. She told me that, you know, and we're building a new head office. She said that, you know, from her research that we need to have women or any, not just women, people dropped home late at night. And I actually, so this was my attitude. Oh, I said, fair don't enough. Surely no, there no, are no, some no, organizations. No, listen, but I'm like just that. here. My attitude was like, don't be stupid. Why can't people just go home on their own? Why do, they're not children. My, at, I'm saying uh, my attitude, and I think I'm quite an open person. Obviously, I'm not feeling this because I have my own car and driver and go home when I want, correct? And I actually brushed it off. She said, no, you don't. She said, no, you don't know what you're talking about because everyone's asked for this, correct? And a couple of other conversations that I had, this was sort of, it's a very simple, small thing, correct? But if someone doesn't ask it, someone doesn't push it, and we just say this organizations like that. But no, honestly, I also think that it's exciting to actually be here and have this conversation. Uh, 
for me it is, I always feel that it's challenging that often corporates call you in to actually have, um, to do a training workshop. It's never but saying that, okay, I'm going to actually sit there and have this conversation. So, yes. Your plugs like you don't need, else. but a couple of people. We just we we are sort of way over time, but this has been a fascinating conversation because I think we've talked about women and getting men involved and working mothers and what the next generation can do and what parents can do. So I think you know, so for someone like me who's living and breathing diversity every day, I'm just so amazed that everyone is passionate about it. Uh, so thank you for that.